Good, good evening, Your Excellencies, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends of FNF. Welcome, welcome to the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Um, I'm so happy to see familiar faces, also very happy to see some new faces, and we hope this is not the last time that we'll see you. As we, thank you also for uh, beating the traffic. I know some people are still um, coming through it, but thank you for making it on time. Uh, we're very excited that you have joined us for our first installment of the Freedom Dialogue. Uh, as we embark on this journey of dialogue and exploration, we are three thrilled to welcome you all. And thank you for uh, agreeing to be part of this journey. Uh, our intention is that we're going to have a series of these events as we go, uh, as the year unfolds. I'm delighted to introduce our esteemed uh, regional director, Ms. Inga Habert, who will guide us through, um, who will introduce us and welcome you all, more formally. Thank you once again for gracing us with your presence, and I hope that you enjoyed tonight's dialogue session. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Kwesi. Uh, a warm welcome on behalf of uh, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Um, some of you have been here last year, exactly one year ago, on the 7th of March, we opened uh, this venue, actually, and uh, the weather was horrible and everything was muddy, and I'm, I'm so happy that now we are here since a year now and we can use this venue, and this is actually, we had a lot of events already here, we're making the space available for partners and, and for trainings, uh, but um, with um, yeah, buying this office and having a venue like this, which we call the Think Tank, we had this idea to organize a series of events, and uh, that's Kwesi, who I want to introduce now, who because he didn't really introduce himself, who actually conceived uh, these events. So they're called the Freedom Dialogues, and uh, there's a whole series of it, and we are looking into discussing relevant topics, and I think the most relevant topic in the moment in South Africa, or one of the most relevant, is actually uh, the elections um, coming up, and so, um, yeah, we are, we are really um, happy to have this topic here today. Kwesi has been working with Dr. Dr. Popa Latze, when she was the executive mayor uh, of Joburg. I won't introduce um, Po because um, 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 Quinnin will do that. Mm -hmm. So I just int introduced um, Kwesi for this. Yeah, so today's topic is coalitions, which is a bit quick topic here, but we also have a lot of uh, German people here today. Uh, we always uh, pride ourselves as a German uh, foundation to say we have a lot of experience in coalitions and we are bringing trainers to negotiate coalitions and so, but if you follow German news in the moment, we're also having a very difficult time as a coalition. So I think these topics which we are discussing today are relevant for, for many countries. So. Um, I don't want to say any further on that, so I hand back to Kwesi, right? It's my privilege to introduce um, Queenan, who's a senior political journalist from Daily Maverick. Uh, Queenan and I exchanged um, <laughs> a joke. I said, Queenan, I'm very nervous. I don't like talking too much. I like working behind the scenes. And Queenan's like, yeah, me too, crazy, but so we'll, we'll hold each other's hands throughout tonight. <laughs> so if you see me walking across to her and just tapping her, just let her know that we are keeping our promise to each other. Okay. Uh, Queenan is a distinguished senior political analyst from the Daily Maverick. And her journey is a testament to her dedication and expertise in the field of journalism. Hailing from the diamond-encrusted streets of Kimberley, Queenan has become a seasoned political analyst and a prominent feature of South Africa's political commentariat. She has worked at several established media houses in various roles and capacities, including The Voice of Vets, Eyewitness News, Huffington Post, City Press, and KFM. In her current role, Queenan serves as a senior political reporter at Daily Maverick. Her articles continue to set the news agenda with incisive analysis and compelling storytelling. Her dedication to uncovering the truth and shedding light on pressing and complex political issues serves as a beacon of journalistic integrity and excellence. Beyond her professional endeavors, Queen and finds solace in fitness, music, and culinary pursuits, <laughs> embodying a vibrant zest for life that enriches her work and inspires those around her. Please join me in welcoming Queen and Maswabi, who will serve as our moderator this evening.
But before I call on Queen Lynn to start, I'd just like to kick off tonight's session with a little video. And it will set the context for the discussion that we're having to be the first female mayor of Johannesburg. It's a huge honor. I don't take it for granted. Joburg is the economic hub of South Africa and in many ways of the continent. To be trusted with such a mammoth task as a female is really saying to a lot of women out there that you can do it, you can be trusted too. In fact, Helen said to me, if I pull this off, she will personally nominate me for a Nobel Prize. So. <laughs> It is quite a, um, a, a daunting task. This has been the culmination of weeks of lots of hard work by our national leadership as well as national leadership of the various parties involved in the coalition. We have really learned from our past experiences. We make sure we don't repeat mistakes that we've seen in the past. We now come to the keynote address by the Executive Mayor, Councillor Paul Palazzi possibly one of the hardest working politicians in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, I could go on for days outlining the work done by this multi-party government over the last eight months to restore hope and dignity in the lives of our residents. But what was said today gives you an idea of the task that we have ahead of us until the year 2026 when this term of office ends. I have filed papers in the Gauteng High Court in Johannesburg to have last week's special council meeting of the city of Johannesburg declared unlawful. I'm overwhelmed. I feel sad for our residents. I feel sad for the city. The city was in good hands and it's really sad that it ended up like this. Um, I am relieved, however, compared to the last time that this was done legally. Um, our coalition was never stable. There were always um, a complaints from some of the smaller parties, particularly, you know, um, demanding more. And, and that's why we saw the horse trading that ensued and, and, and we saw the ultimate fragmentation and, and collapse of that coalition. What pushed me out really was the deprofessionalization of the space, the influx of the unskilled and the unschooled, the rampant corruption, the looting with absolute impunity, and just the fragmentation within the coalition opposition block, uh, which does not give hope that you know we will see an end to what is happening anytime soon. So you let us know if it was as dramatic as the music. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I'd like to let Queen Anne take over from here. I hope you enjoy it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Fizzy. Don't believe anything that he said, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, good evening to everyone. Um, so the 2024 provincial and national elections have been dubbed to be as important as South Africa's first democratic elections in 1994. And this is because of the waning support by South African citizens for the ANC and potentially the entry of new political parties who are contesting these elections. That's why it's important for us to continue these conversations around coalitions because this is potentially what we're facing after May 29th coalition governments at provincial and possibly national level. I'm here with uh, Dr. Mpopalatene, as you saw, um, she's been in a coalition government and um, she knows all the ups and downs that come with it. Um, Dr. Mpo is a medical doctor and she was propelled into politics because of the realities she saw on the ground regarding the medical field. And in 2016, she is um, elected as part of the mayoral committee um, under Herman Mashava. 
And then subsequently in 2024, we see Dr. Mpo as the executive mayor of the city of Joburg, the first woman to ever hold the position. And one common thread we can talk about when it comes to the city of Joburg is the coalition government always being voted out by opposition parties. And I think, as you've seen, she was a part of the coalition government that was kicked out by the opposition led by the ANC. And they are currently governing for the past year. Um, Dr. Mpo, I'm so excited to chat to you. And um, I have kind of spoken about your journey, but I'd love you to elaborate more on what propelled you to get into politics. Thank you so much, Queenie, and thank you for hosting us. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you to all of you for attending. Um, I'm a medical doctor, as you've said, by profession. I've worked in, in the private sector and in the public sector in all kinds of settings in different parts of the country. I've worked in very rural settings. I've worked in urban settings. I've worked in mining settings, uh, where a lot of money gets pumped into health services. So I've been exposed to different types of um, um, service delivery models in healthcare. But I was particularly concerned by the failure of government to work together across portfolios towards helping the individual on the ground. And this became more pronounced when I was doing disability medicine. I got contracts with SASA, which is our social security agency. I had contracts in two provinces in Gauteng and, and in the Northwest. Um, the bulk of the work I did was in the Northwest, which was quite impoverished. There was great poverty, unemployment. And I saw many people coming to request disability um, grants who actually had no disability. They were just taking chances, people with previous cesarean sections, people with uncontrolled diabetes, and I realized these people are really in need of jobs. Um, I realized there were no jobs anywhere near where they lived. The, the place was greatly underdeveloped. Um, I saw great fragmentation in how government was working towards helping these people, and that's what pulled me into public service, and I came back to Johannesburg in 2011. I was at Wits University for four years studying public health medicine, which is public administration with a focus on health care. And my passion was social determinants of health, so upstream determinants that influence health care. For instance, access to proper housing, access to clean running water, proper sanitation, clean energy, and so on, including employment and so on. And, and that was really my passion. And many people say I left my profession to join politics, but actually I did not. Um, I went and, and served in a better space where I had greater influence uh, beyond just the health system wi which I was confined to up until that point. Um, and so I served as an MMC for health and social development for three years in the 2016 coalition under Mayor Herman Mashaba until he resigned in 2019. And then I subsequently put my hand up to become the mayor. Um, and, and that was for me very exciting because it gave me again influence beyond just health and social development but into housing, into um, the water services department into other utilities like energy and as you know we drove quite an extensive program in in growing energy supply in Johannesburg as an example yeah and can we go to 2016 particularly where the DA had to be in a coalition with the EFF um, but it was a of course a verbal agreement that you had with the EFF at the time what do you think prompted the party to say they would work with another political party that has completely different principles and a completely different vision to the DA? Well, so first of all, we were not in coalition with the EFF. We had coalition partners. The EFF wanted to be known as a voting partner and not a coalition partner. And so they didn't sign a coalition agreement with us. It was a very difficult relationship with the EFF. As you said, I was MMC in that administration. Um, the EFF called us the better devil. Um, it was either us or the ANC. And as you recall, the history of the EFF is that they came out of the ANC. In fact, they were kicked out of the ANC. So at the time, the relationship with the ANC was antagonistic, and, and they saw us as the, as the better devil. But there were challenges um, towards getting to an agreement where they did not want Mayor Herman Mashaba. Um, they were concerned about having him as mayor, and they almost put that forward as a condition for working with, with our coalition, but subsequent to um, um, several negotiations, they managed to reach a compromise, uh, but it certainly was not an easy coalition. So the three years when you were in MMC, 
what could you say were some of the biggest achievements by um, the DA-led coalition? Let me start with the portfolio that I oversaw. Mm -hmm. So I was in charge of health and social development, as I've said. And I brought my experience in, in the healthcare system into that space. I brought my networks into the space. And we managed to achieve quite a few things. One, we extended hours of service in our clinics. Um, a lot of breadwinners, particularly men, and also women who work, they often have to choose between attending um, to their health issues or, or going to work. Because unemployment is so rife, people are holding on to their jobs, and that was not helping with, with, with um, addressing the burden of disease in South Africa. And so we were able to open our clinics beyond four o'clock, five o'clock. Um, the latest we closed was 10 o'clock at night. We were in conversation with the Provincial Department of Health, who was the key mandate holder, to open some of our clinics for 24 hours, although we didn't reach that um, by the time Herman resigned, but we were well on our way um, in those negotiations. Mm -hmm. The second thing we did is we, we saw a huge burden of substance abuse in Johannesburg. At the time when we entered the city, there was only one facility, a 12-bed facility for teenage boys. It wasn't even run by the city. It was run by Sanka on behalf of the city. There was no in-house capacity to deal with substance abuse, and yet the problem was so huge. So we started the rollout of substance abuse treatment centers. Uh, I think by the time we uh, Herman resigned and we were ousted, uh, we had rolled out five linked to some of our clinics in, in the high burden area like Alexandra, Soweto, El Dorado Park, the city center, and so on. Um, another exciting project, and this was um, as a result of a motion that was actually sponsored by the EFF. Um, because the EFF is so passionate about serving informal settlements, they brought a motion to council that we should have mobile clinic facilities mm -hmm. going to underserved areas, and I had the privilege of rolling out that program. Our first one was a donation from PPC um, in one of the um, labor sending areas or in, in terms of their social labor um, um, a, a program of their plan, and um, we subsequently rolled out another 10, um, going to various underserved areas in, in the various regions of the city. But there were various other uh, good programs across the various 10 portfolios in the city. Um, I think we were well on our way to some good work. But that government lasted three years, so Herman only resigned in November of 2019, three years into the term of office. I'd like you to also maybe um, describe what a coalition agreement looks like, because I think it's fairly new um, for South Africans. Um, maybe elaborate more on what a DA coalition agreement looks like. Yeah. So in 2016, we, we didn't have a coalition agreement. Um, I don't think that we anticipated that we would be in government. As much as we campaigned and we were positive, um, I, I kind of feel like it caught us off guard when it did happen. And, and so it was a season of trial and error, and that is why I believe the coalition didn't last. Uh, what led to the collapse was a, a rift between the mayor and his own caucus, uh, a rift between the mayor and his political party. Um, I don't know if you heard Julius Malema recently saying we were controlling Herman Mashaba, we told him what to do, and those were the sentiments from within the Democratic Alliance, from within the caucus, and, and that led to the collapse. So there was really no um, guiding principles as to what we were doing. We, we were just figuring it out as we went along, and that gave rise to the need to have a coalition agreement ahead of the 2021 election. So the DA in particular started putting a bit of work into that, um, obviously looking at best practice internationally and trying to be as comprehensive as possible. It was difficult, though, to get buy-in from the other parties because mm -hmm. it's a DA um, agreement. Um, so the DA had to sort of put it as a framework on the table and say, have a look at it, make your inputs, make your changes, uh, and we ended up with an agreement. That agreement was not worth the paper it was written on. Clearly. <laughs> it was not enforceable. Yeah. It had many gaps. Um, a lot of the gaps really, um, we, we could discount if we were dealing with reasonable people. And, and, and an example of that is that, you know, no agreement in a country can supersede the laws of the country. And you would almost assume that people know that and, and that they would not be opportunistic and, and want to, to enforce clauses in the coalition that potentially are in contradiction with the laws of the country, but that we saw that happening. Um, a good example of that is one incident where I was about to table a, a, a report in council on alleged corruption by a senior manager as per legislation, and 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 somebody uh, and one of the parties, actually, say in particular, 
was able to stop me in terms of one of the clauses. They raised a dispute and they said, this has to go to the coalition oversight group. And so there were delays and so on and so forth. Um, I, of course, subsequently wrote to the leader of the coalition oversight group, say, please, can you come and assist us? Um, we need to talk and we need to fix certain things. Our coalition agreement cannot supersede the laws of the country and I cannot be found on the wrong side of the law because somebody raised a dispute in terms of the coalition agreement. So those are some of the things. Um, one of the issues is, of course, that it's, it's not enforceable, it's not binding. Uh, we saw parties walk away um, freely with no recourse legally or otherwise because it's really not an enforceable um, um, document. It's really an in principle document that, hey, we're working together, we're walking together, uh, but it's really not worth the paper it's written on. Um, we do know now that the DA and a few other parties have signed the multi-party charter ahead of the 2024 national provincial elections. Um, hopefully that will work better. Uh, reading through it, you'll see areas of compromise where the DA had been strict on certain principles. For instance, in 2021, when I was elected mayor, um, Herman Mashaba, Action SA, as well as UDM and various other parties felt that Herman Mashaba should become the mayor, in spite of the fact that he was only, he only had the third largest number of seats in council with ANC at number one and the DA at number two. Mm -hmm. And the DA was insistent that because they had the largest largest number of seats in our coalition, we should get the mayorship. And, and we see that in the multi-party charter, the DA has compromised and said, it does not necessarily have to follow that if you have the greatest number of seats, you will get the presidency, but if you don't get presidency, you'll get to be the leader of, of government business. So we're seeing greater compromise, and I think it's because of learnings from what happened in 2021. It is work in progress. And, and you talk about the lapses with the coalition agreement itself. Um, I can imagine that when you do sign an agreement with uh, other political parties, they also come with their own ideas and how uh, the city should be run. What kind of horse trading was done in 2016 versus in 2021? Well, so I was not really part of the 2016 coalition negotiations mm -hmm. because I was just an MMC. Um, in 2021, I was part of the negotiations to a large extent, although some parts um, you are insulated from people who, who stand to benefit uh, just to keep it pure and to make sure that everything is above board. Um, there was a lot of horse trading, so I can share a bit of what happened in 2021. So we ended up with 10 political parties in our coalition initially. Of course, Al Jamaa pulled out just after the announcement, and I can get into that at a later stage. But it was quite interesting to be part of those negotiations because like I said, you would expect that um, it would follow, that because the DA had 71 seats, followed by Action SA with 44 seats, and then other parties with much smaller numbers of seats, that, that the mayorship would go to the DA, and so on and so forth, uh, but there was a lot of discontent from the other parties, there was disagreement on whether or not our voices are the same, irrespective of the number of seats we bring to the coalition, the smaller parties felt it should not matter how many seats you bring, you are one voice, and they are one voice, and so you're equal, the DA felt it can't be the same, uh, the voice of the DA must be louder, and so on and so forth. So there were also a lot of things that were not explicitly um, discussed and really thrashed out ahead of starting to govern together. Um, so yes, there was a lot of horse trading based on the principles that each of the partners believed um, should guide the formation of this coalition. But ultimately, we reached a lot of compromise. Of course, we started with the DA dominating um, in, in, in the top structures. We had the mayor, we had the speaker, we had the chief whip, but that was just a function of our lack of readiness at the election of these public office bearers. You recall that on that day, on the 22nd of November, when I was elected mayor and we elected the speaker and the chief whip, we actually did not have a coalition. We went into that meeting with our 26%. We had no partners because there was no agreement on the mayorship of Herman Mashaba. Mm -hmm. and, and so we didn't know what the outcome would be, and the outcome was what it was. And we ended up dominating the leadership structures. You'll see that in the multi-party charter, it talks about a separation of powers within the coalition. Um, that's, of course, um, with future coalitions, and that's because because of those, um, those experiences. Now, subsequent to that, we did form a coalition and now we had to look at the remainder of the portfolios. We had the chair of chairs, which is effectively the chairperson of chairpersons of oversight committees. Um, and that ended up going to a one-seat party, COPE. 
Um, Pope wanted an MMC position in spite of the fact that they only had one seat. Uh, we tried to explain to them, how do we explain to other parties who have more seats than you that they're not part of um, the executive and yet you want to be part of the executive. And again, it's an example of those parties that felt it doesn't matter how many seats we bring to the table, we're all equal and we should get equal opportunity. And so they got the chair of chairs position um, and then we looked at chairpersons of oversight committees which were spread ac across the various political parties. When it came to sharing portfolios, that was probably the toughest part. Um, I recall that the morning of the press briefing where we were to announce the coalition and the MMCs, we actually had no coalition. We met online until very late at night and we still ended up with no coalition. There was no agreement on which portfolios should go to which political party. Of course, each party goes in with its own desires. Um, the DA had many ward councillors. Uh, we had 43 ward councillors and DA councillors felt because we have so many ward councillors that deal with water outages, electricity outages, it only makes sense for the utilities, for instance, portfolio to be within um, a DA run portfolio, to be with, with a, a DA MMC. I, I alluded to the fact that we had many ward councillors, and often politics plays itself out in the administration. It's not supposed to be because of the separation of party and state clause in the constitution, but often it happens and we saw it happen. And, and I have many stories that I can share where, where we saw, for instance, a development planning MMC complaining they don't even have support from the police force when they go and do their raids, but when economic development goes and does their raids, the whole JMPD force is there, all the vehicles and everything. Um, and so you saw a very lopsided approach to to how we work together transversely across all the portfolios. And, and, and parties just wanted to safeguard themselves from that kind of abuse and opportunistic tendencies. And, and that's why um, you know, we looked at if, if our partners don't play nice, what is the safest and what is it that we can do for our residents? Um, um, uh, with the little that we got. And utilities for the DA was a non-negotiable, um, finance was a non-negotiable, city planning uh, was a non-negotiable, and I think we, we ended up with another uh, fourth portfolio. Uh, oh yeah, we ended up with, with group corporate and shared services, which is HR and shared services across the city. Yeah, and when we talk about the so-called coalition partners, you emphasize every time that uh, there was no agreement with the EFF right, in 2016, and in 2021, they kind of put the DA in a corner by voting with you without any formal agreement. So if, you, if the DA was burnt in 2016, why then allow yourself to work with the EFF, which abandoned you at the last minute, um, without having a formal conversation about what the agreement means and what it entails? So in 2016, there were talks with the EFF ahead of the formation of government. In 2021, there were none. Um, we have no control over how people vote. It's an election, um, it's, a, it's a secret vote. People vote how they want to vote. And so we, we, we had no control over how the EFF voted. They decided to donate their vote and I was elected mayor and a DA councillor was elected speaker and chief whip respectively. Yeah, but I, I still believe that if it is that in 2016, the DA was burnt by the EFF, and yes, you don't have control over who they vote with in, in 2021. Surely, once they do vote with the DA across all the municipalities, as they did, especially in Gauteng, um, where the DA got an opportunity to govern in municipalities they'd never governed in before, wouldn't it um, you know, ease the situation to go ahead and talk to them after they vote with you? W was there no attempt to do that? So there's different schools of thought on what ought to have happened. And let's go back a bit to what happened after the 2019 national election, where we, we lost support and there was a review within the Democratic Alliance to look at what went wrong. And, and, and part of the outcome of that review was that our relationship with the EFF cost us dearly. And the DA had to then make a promise to its constituency that it would not enter into any agreements with the, with the EFF going forward, and the DA felt that they needed to stay true 
to their promise to, to, to their constituency. But like I said, the EFF did what they did anyways, and they, they, they put us in government, and we continued to govern because we believed we had something to offer and we believed we could turn the city around. Um, so that's one school of thought. But yes, there's another school of thought that says you were in a vulnerable position, mm -hmm. you were always going to be ousted, and I see where that's coming from. And you recall that when I was mayor, um, I had a lot of back and forth with the leadership of the party, the federal executive, trying to say, let us talk, let's see how we can work with the EFF. And yes, the EFF can be difficult, but I mentioned that when I was MMC Health and Social Development, we implemented mobile clinic services uh, pursuant to a, a, a motion that was sponsored by the EFF. So there is some good that can come out of working with the EFF, but these all, they're also very difficult to work with and you would need to manage them. And yes, 2016 was not managed so well. They ended up wielding too much power over the mayorship and, and, and subsequently the entire government. I think I'm more curious about you know <laughs> this rating of the best party to work with the worst. And I know obviously the DA feels the EFF obviously is one of the worst parties to work with in any coalition agreement. But can you just maybe um, take me through the other political parties and how you felt working with them so we can get a slight idea of what to expect maybe in this election? Okay, so based on my own personal experience, so in our executive, we had the DA with four portfolios, so I won't comment on that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We had Action SA with three portfolios, and I've already alluded to some of the challenges. Um, the history between the DA and Action SA is noteworthy. It's not to be taken lightly. Herman Mashabo, who's the founder of Action SA, was a DA mayor. Uh, when he left the Democratic Alliance, he was disgruntled. He felt he was pushed out by the DA. He felt unsupported, and he, he wrote a whole book. I mean, the chief of staff in his office then uh, wrote The Accidental Mayor, which, which tells a story. Of course, a lot of us in the DA feel the story that was told is not how it actually played out, but there's a story for another day. But, but I mentioned this because it talks to the disposition of Action SA towards the Democratic Alliance, whether in coalition or not. And this started playing itself out when I was campaigning. So on the day that I was launching uh, my manifesto as, as a mayoral candidate, um, I was set up outside the metro center with a stage, sound, and there was media, and I was about to deliver the manifesto. And there comes a group in green t-shirts, they're singing and they're dancing, um, just at the time I'm about to deliver my speech, causing disruptions and so on. So, so already at an early uh, stage, we started to see how they were going to, to position themselves towards us. Um, another example is on, on, on the 16th of June, which is our youth day, at the Hector Peterson Memorial, the same thing happened at this time, we were already in coalition with, with Action SA. And just at the time, I was supposed to lay my wreath, as is tradition every year. They, they surrounded the place where it was supposed to happen. They started singing, and they blocked me from doing it. But we were in coalition together. Within government, there were various challenges. Um, I often felt Action SA undermined the office of the mayor. They had a desperate need to distinguish themselves as being um, a, a, not a DA light, as many identify them as. So they needed to to identify themselves as, as being independent of the DA. They needed to outdo the DA. They were not very supportive of me as mayor, um, often undermining my authority, not allowing me to do proper oversight over their work, which is part of the work of, 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 of the mayor's office, and, and not really working well transversely with other portfolios outside of Action SA. So they were by far the most difficult coalition partner for me to work with as mayor, and I believe it's primarily because of the history between the DA and Action SA. I do think that's something they should look out for because it is counterproductive. We can't afford it. We, we certainly can't have it at a national level. Um, it, it does not work. It's actually self-sabotage because they ended up being affected by, by the negative things that they were doing themselves. Um, I, I, so, so, so they had three portfolios. And then we had the IFP. They had housing. I had a brilliant relationship with the housing, MMC, with the party, no issues at all. Uh, we worked well. They were collaborative. Collaborative. Um, I didn't sense any competition, contestation. They had their space, they were comfortable. But again, they were a more established party than Action SA. They've been around, they've got a national footprint. They didn't have as much of a need to prove themselves as Action SA. It was their first time governing, and I think that also might have influenced their behavior. Um, and then ACDP had a portfolio as well. Um, again, an, an absolute joy to work with, no issues whatsoever. Um, 
And then the other portfolio initially went to Freedom Front Plus, no issues, and then when they gave it up to make room for the PA to join the coalition, it went to the PA, no issues with the PA at a portfolio level. And then of course you had parties that only got um, positions in the legislature, so chairpersons of oversight committees, there were challenges. There were always challenges with Colleen Makubela of COBE. She was never happy with being chair of chairs, as I've already alluded. She wanted to be a member of the executive. Often there was overreach. Um, as you know, there's a separation of powers, uh, but there was often overreach. Um, she wanted undue oversight on the work of the executive. Um, the, she, would, she would lament that I sent out a statement without sharing it with them first. Um, the cycle of local government news is very fast for efficiency you simply cannot, you know, once issues have been discussed as mayor, as the spokesperson, you should be able to speak on behalf of the city with the support of your coalition partners. So there were those kinds of issues. It was really a, a, a battle for power and a battle for influence. And of course, there were factions within the coalition. So with COPE, you had the smaller parties who felt, oh, the DA is bullying us, the bigger parties are bullying us. So you had the UIM, you had ATM um, in one corner with COPE, and we saw that uh, with the with the ousting of the speaker because that those are the parties that deflected and and ultimately with my ousting we saw the PA joining them yeah so um, obviously you kind of had uh, the best of both worlds when it comes to that um, but what consequences were there for such a dysfunctional system because I've uh, you know, seen how budgets are not passed because political parties are not agreeing. And a lot of this also affects ordinary citizens. Um, can we just talk about that more? Yeah. So ideally, you need an, an administration that can be insulated from political instability. So ideally, you need your technocrats in the city to carry on the work of delivering service to residents as per the five-year RDP, regardless of what is happening at a political level. But often, that's not what happens. So a good example, I'm ousted in September for 25 days. Um, and, and in that time, you have another mayor. During a mayoral committee meeting, in fact, it was their first mayoral committee meeting since our illegal ousting, they received news that the High Court has overturned my ousting and effectively reinstated me. And right there and then, the then mayor says to officials, I'll be back next week. Now, you place yourself in the shoes of that official. Here comes Mpopalata the next day. I'm back, I'm the mayor. But you remember the other mayor who illegally ousted her, and the only reason she's back is because of an illegal process. They already have the numbers on their side. So you're already thinking they will be back. So we saw great tension between my office or our executive and officials, where people were playing safe. They didn't want to jeopardize their positions. Um, there's, they, uh, there's a lot of casualties when, when political power changes hands, where officials that are seen to be working closely with a particular administration are often victimized or, or, or marginalized when the next administration comes in. So a lot of officials started calculating, you know, what is likely to happen. Um, he said he'll be back. They've got the numbers. We don't see the DA and their partners having strategy, so we're going to play safe. And so you saw that sort of thing playing out. Unfortunately, because of that, then the city gets affected, service delivery gets affected, people start dragging their feet, there's sabotage, unions are used against us as the political administration, and so on and so forth, and that's where you see a breakdown of service delivery. So my criticism about, you know, the back and forth, um, the court action, the initial one, um, that the ANC lost, and then subsequently uh, you going back into office, and then, so that, that back and forth for me, at the time, as somebody who was following it closely, I felt was extremely unnecessary. Um, I, I believe that as soon as the Democratic Alliance uh, realized that they didn't have the numbers, that um, you know the honorable thing for you know citizens and for the situation was to step back. Um, that was just my opinion. And right. I know that as a political party, you always do need to fight. Mm. But in that instance, I, I believe that if you know the odds are against you mm. and nothing is going to change, why put residents through it? So there's two things. One, yes, we owe it to those who voted us into office to fight, to, to come back, because that's why they gave us the 71 seats. 
But secondly, we did not see this coming. And therefore, there was never a window of negotiation. And us coming back was offering us that window of negotiation. It was giving us an opportunity to go back to these political parties and several meet meetings were held. What went wrong? What is the problem? Can we fix it? You know, certain parties dealt with councillors who voted against our coalition. You recall that some were expelled, um, they were replaced, and so on and so forth. So there was a lot of work in that window uh, between the end of September when we were reinstated and the end of Jan when we were ultimately ousted. And that work could have succeeded. Um, it's a chance we needed to take. The residents of Johannesburg deserved it because we were going to give them a better government. Okay. Um, so right now I'd like to give um, the floor an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, we'll take about like three or four questions. Yes, please uh, do introduce yourself. Tell us which organization you're from. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. I'm Ayanda Ali from Build One South Africa. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you for a riveting discussion and an honest response to all the questions. I think it's enlightening and refreshing to hear honesty from someone in the political space. Um, my question is twofold. I want to know, as a woman, as a professional, who was leading different people from all walks of life, different political persuasions, religious beliefs, and the like, how difficult was, was it for you as an individual? And what do you know now that you wish you knew then? Not so much politically, because I see that you've done a lot of going back and learning from those lessons, but as an individual, as a leader, what do you know now that you wish you knew then? And if given the chance, what would you do differently? Thank you. Um, my name is Chantal D'Souza, and I'm just a Johannesburg citizen who is very upset at the current stage of affairs, but I mean, I think we all are. But I was very interested by you being so honest about your difficult relationship with Action SA. And there's been some talk that because the Democratic Alliance and Action SA share similar donors, that the donors might be able to play a role in calming the situation and the alliance. I just wanted to hear your, your take on that. Are there any more questions? I'm Janet Munakami from Vets Mining Institute at Vets University. So I'm actually a Pan-African feminist scholar. And I'm very passionate about women in leadership. I've actually conducted extensive research and also written extensively around women uh, in leadership position. And when I used to see you on television, I would say, yes, let her continue. <laughs> but I, all the same, I knew about all the baggages, all the dirty, you know, linen behind, and all those aspects where you'll be even labeled. So my question is actually quite, uh, frankly related to her earlier, which is why I wanted to actually speak soon after her. Um, and it's more to do with um, your positionality, of course, because from the scientific research that I've been involved in, I think there's also, there are issues around women assuming political leadership positions, but at the same time, you know, the issues of intersectionality or multiple oppression as black women comes to the fore and perhaps could have been, uh, have contributed to all that undermining that you, do you think that could have played um, any role, your personality as a black young woman, energetic and all that kind of the ageism as well, all those multiple intersectional factors that our society always subscribes to. Is that do, it? Uh, I th there's more, but I think we can go for another round of questions. Okay, yeah. let's just do the first round. All right, thank you so much for the questions. Ayanda, um, yeah, you asked about how working in such a diverse environment affected me personally as a woman um, and with my background. 
fortunately, having been trained as a medical professional and a medical doctor, um, I, I was interfacing a lot with different types of patients over many, many years. Um, and so I, I think my experience helped a lot. I, I also spent four years in public health medicine at Wits University. So that's public administration. Again, um, very experiential training. We were placed in various services, so that also gave me a lot of experience. Um, in the lockdown, I also registered for a coaching, corporate coaching course, and that really prepared me a lot for managing diversity, particularly managing the, the, the coalition, it grew my emotional intelligence and so on and so forth, dealt with attitudes and you know and my, my own social awareness and my own management of complex social environments. Um, I really think it was, it, was, it was helpful. So there was a lot of preparation, a lot of um, sometimes unintentional preparation and experience along the way that came in very handy. Um, but you asked what I learned and what I know now that I didn't know then. So when I started out as a DA counselor, I didn't set out to become a politician and I struggled a lot self-identifying as a politician. I hated that label. Um, and, and so I didn't really participate in the politics of the DA. So in my years, my three years of being an MMC, my focus is government. And I never put my hand up for any positions. It was for other people, it was not for me. I was the technocrat, I was the doctor, the public health activist, and that was my role. And I was, I was focusing on rolling out the programs that I set out to roll out. I now know that you have no leverage if you are not politically active within your political party. And that's why you saw me put my hand up to challenge for the role of federal leader of the party after I was ousted because in a lot of the conversations with the federal executive of the DA in the coalition negotiations, I felt that there were huge gaps that needed to be addressed, and I felt that I had no leverage because I was just a mayor, um, and, and I was left out of critical decision-making processes of the FedEx because mayors are not part of the FedEx of the DA, so, so at best I would be allowed to come and make a presentation and then I would be excused and people would deliberate and, you know, and, and at times um, somebody else would represent my, my case and so on and so forth. And, and so that's what I learned, that as much as I don't like politics and as much as I don't like the tag, it is an important means to an end, and the end for me is delivering service. And if I have to become a politician to do that, then I need to do that. And, and I will again put my hand up, I've not given up, so now I'm happy to be called a politician. If that's what it <laughs> takes to fix the country, I am a politician. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, that's definitely what I would do differently is greater involvement, should tell. Um, donors, sure, that's a very interesting question and, and a very intelligent one at that because that is a gap that a lot of people don't see but some who see it do exploit it. So I know that in, in certain conversations where we were at loggerheads in the coalition, we've often wondered who are the donors that we can talk to, who can bring us around the table and help us see eye to eye. So we saw donors as pot potential mediators because they would have invested in the success of the coalition, particularly if they were funding more than one player in the coalition. And if there was a, a dispute between those players, we saw them as potential mediators that could speak sense and help us see eye to eye and so on. But um, the question of donors can also be abused. So, so it's, it's a very tricky terrain to navigate. And I think that's why a legislation that says donors must be declared openly, there must be transparency um, so that we can see what is happening. But yes, absolutely, we do have the same donors and at some point we did have the conversation. Like I said, and I think we had inadequate capacity in the coalition itself at a national level to handle conflict and disputes. So we wrote an entire dossier, particularly where Action SA was concerned. Across all DA portfolios, we, we detailed blow by blow incidents that happened and submitted to our national coalition oversight group. Um, and, and unfortunately, I, I, I don't know whether it was cap a capacity issue or a time issue, um, our, our, our grievances were never addressed until we were ousted. So, 
So I do believe that in, in such an instance, we could potentially have also brought in donors, you know, and various other independent players to sit us around the table and see if we could not uh, find each other and, and, and have some reason prevail. Jeanette, um, you've said quite a mouthful. Um, I, I'd, I'd, and I'm, 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 you see, I'm stuttering because what I'm about to say is very political. Um, I often say that I'm not, I'm not a feminist. And I often say to women, we should never expect a certain type of treatment because we are women. Um, I've invested a lot in myself over the years. I have studied a lot. I've given myself a lot of experience uh, across different fields. Um, I've studied outside of medicine as well, and I don't want to give you my CV, but I'm just saying that I do not enter any space thinking I'm a woman, therefore. While I celebrated the fact that I was the first woman mayor for Johannesburg as a metropolitan city, and I qualify that because there was a, a female mayor in Joburg in 1957 or so, but it was a smaller Joburg, not the metro. Anyway. I celebrated that. It was a milestone. Um, it was a significant one for a lot of the women who celebrated with me, and I did celebrate that. Um, and many people's lives were changed. Many women were inspired to do greater things in their own spaces, and I respect that, and I continue to celebrate it. But I never expected any special treatment because I'm a woman. And looking back, I honestly don't think that things would have played out differently had I been a male mayor. People wanted power. Whether male or female, they wanted power. Action SA wanted the mayorship. Whether the DA had put forward a male mayor or a female mayor, Herman Mashabo wanted the mayorship. Because when he left the city, his plan was, I will come back, I will establish my own vehicle, I will come back, and I will be mayor again on my own terms. So, so I don't think my gender had anything to do with what played out. And, and because of my disposition, and I, and I often say this, that, if you expect that people will marginalize you because of a certain characteristic, how you enter that space, your confidence is affected, right? I don't enter spaces with low confidence because, oh, I'm a woman, low self-esteem, oh, I'm black. And I believe that my voice was heard. I believe my voice was heard in those FedEx platforms where I went and I presented my case. I challenged the leadership of my party. I got into trouble for it. Um, I didn't stop myself. I didn't stop at anything because I'm a woman, because I'm black. And I think it's important, your mindset. Um, and that's why I don't enter any situation thinking I'm a woman, I'm black, therefore people don't see me. You know, I, I, I really think I would be sabotaging myself if I did that. But I'm quite interested to look at the literature that you're referring to. Um, I, yeah, I'm quite interested to look at that. Now, yeah, and that goes across all the characteristics, rage, race, age. Um, you spoke about the pull her down syndrome with Makubele. Do I think that she behaved in the manner she did because I'm female? Makubele, if you look at her history, even before the city of Johannesburg, she's always been very ambitious. Um, she served within the, the SA post office. Yes, she, was. she was a chairperson of the board, mm -hmm. fought then with the minister, uh, um, Minister Ndabeni, Stella Ndabeni. They fought, they took each other to court, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then she came into the city as a chairperson again of an entity. She was chairperson of MTC. That's how she became mayoral candidate for COP and so on. So a very ambitious individual. And you've, if you follow her career, even now, what is happening with the formation of Sarah, you'll see the same trade playing out. Male or female, she fought with, with, with Lakota, who is male, who is, by the way, like a father to her. They had a very close relationship. So I, again, I don't think it's because I was female. I just think it's, it's, a, it's a space where people are hungry for power and they will do anything. Regardless who you are, they'll bulldoze their way to that power if they think it'll get, get them there. Sisi Zagele here, Kupega. I'm just a citizen of Joburg as well. Um, my question, um, given the, you said that a successful administration is one that's insulated from political instability. But given the nature of how we play politics and how it, how it actually played out, the ousting, the coming back, that instability, and given also just the structure of our politics where we have to have a political administration that the administration technocrats report to, how then 
do you, in your opinion, does that insulation get created? And how is it sustainable? Because we should be able to also change politics when it's not working for us, or change the political administration. So there still needs to be that level of leeway, but how do we create something that is sustainable, given our political dynamics and given also the structural um, setup of how our politics works? Thank you. And what they've told me about what happened under Haman Mashaba's government is shocking. For one, we don't have enough fire engines in this Johannesburg. We need between 100 and 120 fire engines. That was passed during those governments, coalition governments. Why did that not happen? The other question I have is that you, you come across saying that coalitions are something new, you know, and people are learning about coalitions. Yet we had a, a government of national unity for the last, you know, since 1994. The question is, what did we do then to get things right and have the world look at us and say, what a wonderful democracy we have. What have we lost and now we're having coalitions? Is it too much of immature parties getting on the bandwagon? So is that it? No more questions? All right. Cesar Kelly, sure. The creation of this insulation. Um, our biggest enemy is corruption. If you look at what's happening now in the city, between politicians and officials in the administration, there's open talk on tenders. Uh, a politician is able to say there's five contracts Let's balance the coalition. Two must go to the ANC, and two must go to the EFF, and one must go to the PA. That is what is happening. Now, one of the challenges we have, and, and this is really a function of how long it took for government to move from the hands of the ANC into a different administration. That, that happened in 2016, from 1994, for the first time. You've got an administration that is largely ANC. So cater deployment means you inherit an NC vehicle and you are hoping that this vehicle will work with you to deliver services for people, including your own constituency. Now that is tricky and that is why the fight against cater deployment that the DA has been driving was so important because that's one of the ways you insulate the administration. Um, the other thing is patronage. Um, you know, the, the, the officials are beneficiaries of patronage by politicians. And so they also have an interest. And because of these illicit economies, um, you find that people are dabbling in spaces they should not be dabbling in. So there's quite a lot we need to deal with. We need to deal with corruption, we need to deal with, um, with cater deployment, with, with the dispensing of patronage and so on. And then we'll be better placed uh, to have an administration that is neutral and that's apolitical. Um, Andy, you, you've said a mouthful. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, you allude to the fact that horse trading um, connotes dishonesty. There was certainly dishonesty. Um, you know, you had a, a, an instance where you, in a meeting with your coalition partners, discussing strategy ahead of a, an election, and somebody is just there to listen, to go and sell information to who they're going to start working with as they betray you. So we saw a lot of that. Um, Gaten McKenzie gave me a call once and said to me, I just wanted to let you know that there's a move to oust you and we've been approached to be part of that. We will never be part of that. Guess what? Um, they were part of my ousting. So, so there was really a lot of dishonesty. Uh, but I hear where you're coming from. Yes, um, the, 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 the resident at the end of the day is the one that suffered. Now, you ask an important question about Usindiso, the Usindiso fire victims. I happened to be MMC Health at the time we handed that building back to the JPC. We closed down the clinic. 80 Albert Street Clinic was one of our flagship extended hours of service clinics. Um, it was the only one in the inner city, and, and we closed it down regardless because of the unsafe 
um, conditions. Environmental health said this building needs to be condemned. We, bought, we brought uh, development planning. The building was condemned and it was handed over and we brought a whole report to mayoral committee, handed it to the JPC. And the report says the JPC is to work with Joshko, which is the social housing company, to identify a temporary emergency accommodation for people that needed to be moved out. And JPC had to secure the building to make sure it's not occupied again. It's not invaded again until um, the issues were taken care of and it could be um, re-inhabited. Re now, that did not happen. It didn't happen, and if you follow the history of the city, you'll note that the JPC has always been a problem child in the city, ungovernable, you know, and, and so on. So, so that's another story. But it's not an indictment on Herman Mashabo or his administration. We did what we needed to do. We closed down the building. Um, JPC did not do its part, and the relationship between the entities and government is one of the things we were trying to address through the institutional review that never went through, because we didn't really have a firm hold on the entities. They were too independent of the mother body, and it was really a very difficult governance framework to navigate. Um, the issue of fire engines, I don't know if you remember, but just before Herman Mashaba's resignation, we actually unveiled many fire e engines that we had just bought. Unfortunately, budget cycles in the city take time, and often people think we can just move into government and start buying things, but it doesn't work like that. Often you move in with budgets that are already committed, and you have to let that um, cycle run its course and plan for the next cycle. And once you've put the, the budget aside, Getting the fire engines on the ground is also another process that can take months or even longer. And so the fact that in the three years we managed to see those fire engines will tell you how early we started working on it. So, so, so there was quite a lot of good work that happened there. Um, you write about the government of national unity, but I've been thinking a lot with the 30 years of democracy around what did we have then that we didn't have now? And, and here's what I see. Um, we had unity as South Africans. We have great fragmentation now. Almost all South Africans were rallying behind the ANC greatly, and yes, some of the other uh, parties that were fighting for a new dispensation. We had the Freedom Charter as a vision that we all bought into, but we also had leadership. We had elders. We, we got two Nobel Peace Prizes because of that peaceful transition. That speaks of leadership at a national level, the ability to rally parties together, leaders together of different uh, groupings to say, how do we transition together without going into civil war, without going into chaos? We don't have that kind of leadership, unfortunately, today. It's every man for himself. There's a gazillion political parties forming every day. Everybody wants to be leader of their own um, organization. And I think that's where we, we got it wrong. I look forward to a time where and we can start to unify again um, in whatever form, and, and we can start to consolidate. Many of us are really punting the same policies, the same principles. There aren't many differences uh, between many of the political parties. Yes, on the extremes, you will have, for instance, the EFF and the DA, huge ideological differences, but on the whole, a lot of the parties are really saying the same thing. We should be able to find each other, and, and with the right leadership, that can happen. Thank you so much for all the questions. <laughs> um, very good, insightful questions. I, I hope that everybody uh, you know, got an opportunity to actually understand how coalitions have been working at local level and how this can play out you know, at provincial and national level. But before we close, Dr. Ampol, we have highlighted so many issues. And I know the DA is working on legislation um, to curb all these issues, uh, one being to increase the percentage uh, threshold per seat to make sure that smaller parties are not there dominating um, talks. I just want to know from your perspective, what else could be done um, as a remedy to all these issues we face in coalition governments? So the DA has invested extensively in research and um, looking at best practice internationally. They've done a lot of work with Denmark, um, they've looked at Germany, they've looked at Kenya on the African continent. They've come up with a private member's bill which proposes five points. The first one is what you spoke about, um, the introduction of a threshold. Denmark has it, Germany has it, uh, we don't have a chair, and that's why we're fighting 
with one seat parties. That's why Al Jamaa has the mayorship with three seats, with the NC with 91 seats, only getting MMC for finance. So, <laughs> so, so that's one of the uh, proposals. The second one, we spoke about how our coalition agreements are not worth the paper they're written on. Um, the DA is proposing that they become binding. And, and we look at mechanisms to, to put that in place. Um, the third one is to have a registrar of political parties, an independent registrar of political parties who will be the secretariat for coalition agreements, publicize them, hold political parties accountable. I think that's a really good one. The, the next one is increasing the time for negotiations between um, election outcomes and the formation of government. Um, I, I shared our story how we didn't have a government on the day of the press briefing where we were supposed to announce a government. We did a lot of things under pressure. A lot of conversations were not had. There were a lot of assumptions. I spoke about how the DA assumed they had a louder voice because of their number of seats and the other parties assumed the voice was equal. So there were a lot of assumptions because there wasn't adequate time to have those crucial conversations. Um, the last one, of course, is reducing the frequency of motions of no confidence. Uh, before I was ultimately asked that there were three other motions that mm -hmm. failed. So you could bring a motion every month. There was really no limit. It's ridiculous. It doesn't um, um, you know, uh, go well for service delivery. And so that's, that's another proposal that the DA is putting on the table. The NC is also working on its own framework. There are some differences between what the NC and the DA are proposing, but there's also some similarities. Um, um, what, what I found interesting when I looked at the multi-party charter as an example, what the ANC is proposing is that whereas the DA has agreed to compromise in saying the party with the greatest number of seats does not have to get the presidency, the NC in, in, its, in its guiding policy is saying no, the one with the greatest number of seats must, must, must lead. But what I also find interesting with the ANC is that here in, in Johannesburg, they have failed to implement the same guiding principle that but they've put you forward. You know, working at the EFF is tough. <laughs> so, That's an example. So the question yeah. is, is it going to be as good as the paper it's written on, or is it mm -hmm. just going to be another paper that they're not able to implement at the end of the day? So there's quite a lot of work going on behind the scenes. Um, at least we know the DA and the ANC are busy, um, and the DA is not alone, of course, with the other parties that have signed the multi-party charter as well. We'll see what happens um, after the elections. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Mpopalate, for making an effort to come. Um, the insights were incredible, and as everyone said, the honesty as well about what truly ensued in the city. Um, thank you for your time. I'm going to hand over to Kwezi now. Um, he will give the takeaways from this conversation. Thank you so much. Um, very insightful conversation. Um, I won't comment on our former DA mayor wearing red, <laughs> 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 um, but uh, thank you so much for taking us into confidence. Mm. Um, I had the, the privilege of being there in, in, in the hot seats, uh, not in the hot seat luckily, but I saw the fires and um, your resilience was very inspiring. So thank you, thank you for letting us into your confidence. Some of the takeaways, I think we, we do require enforceable coalition agreements. And in my thinking, I wonder if the conversation that we're having now is too late because there's no legislation that's there to support us ensuring that there's enforceable coalition agreements. We, and I think that would protect us from horse trading, from dangerous horse trading. Mm. And another takeaway that comes up is that citizens don't have voices. I think Chantal spoke to it. And when horse trading happens, the citizens inevitably are the ones who are going to suffer. And I think mistrust, political mistrust, which is linked to political immaturity. We've got a multi-party charter. And I think you've alluded to the fact that those same parties were fighting quite a lot. And they now promised the country that they won't fight anymore. <laughs> and it will be hunky-dory. And I think it leads to the question that brought us here is, is South Africa ready for coalition government? 
I, I don't know if, if it's a simple yes or no. I, I won't hazard an answer, but I think it's something for you to think about. Is South Africa ready for a national coalition government? But there's one thing that you said towards the end, which is unity. And if we have visionary leadership that can sort of lead us in a way that espouses unity, then I think it gives us a chance. And on that note, I'd like to leave it there. Thank you so much, Queenan. Uh, you're a wonderful moderator. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Queenan will be moderating another panel <laughs> next week. <laughs> Um, at the <laughs> gathering in Cape Town. So please oh, look out for yeah. that. Yes, I will. <laughs> so thank you so much, Kimon. <laughs> and thank you, Dr. Palate. Um, they used to call you Dr. Mayor, Madam Mayor, <laughs> everything under the sun. Thank you so much for your leadership. And we please keep to your promise. Don't leave politics. Uh, we are waiting for visionary leaders like yourself to take up the mantle. And thank you to you all for coming tonight. Um, please uh, enjoy, there'll be some refreshments served outside. Thank you for your time. Please do stay in touch with us. Like I said, this is not the first, this is not the, I mean, it's not the last series, last event. Uh, we'll keep you updated with the next ones. And thank you so much for your time. Please have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.